Amen. 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 Give God a... Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are we're excited about um, preaching today. But before I get to, to preaching, I just want to invite everybody to go outside afterwards. After the sermon is over, after the, after the, um, the service is over, and go outside and uh, go to the tents. We have an awesome um, event coming up called Love Fest. How many of y'all ready for Love Fest? Yeah. Amen. Uh, Pastor Megan and her team are doing an incredible job putting together as we come together to go out in the community and to uh, do outreach and love on, love on the people that we, we're called to serve. Amen. In this, we're going to be giving away bill pays. We're going to be doing, giving away bicycles. We're going to be loving on people, clothes and everything, and just showing everybody what our mission is. What is our mission? To make Christ known by the way we love everywhere we go. Amen. And so we're going to do that, and that's going to be, Love Fest is going to be coming up in, in October, but today, for everybody, we got information about it out at the tent, and if you want, have any questions, Please go out there and let's, uh, let's get this information so we can be a blessing to our community. Amen? Amen. Hey, how was Hangouts for everybody? Amen. 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 Even though we are in a break, know, know that we are not, uh, that doesn't mean you can't hang out with some people. Amen? Uh, we are a church that does life with each other, and so we want you to get together and, and do life with somebody. Find somebody, hang out with them, go to lunch, do something. And let's, uh, let's share the love of Christ, and then when we come back, we'll be ready for third semester. But in the meantime, on Wednesday nights, we also have what? Wednesday night lights. Wednesday night lights. So if you like to play softball, or if you like to run, you like to hit, or if you like to chili, I can't run anymore, so I'm going to be a six, uh, seven, three hundred and whatever pound chili on the side. As I, cheer, as I cheer Pastor Juan on as he runs around the bases. Amen. Amen. It's easier to run when you have the weight of somebody. So we're excited um, and uh, just thank God for, for you. But today my, my, um, my task today is to, uh, to preach a message um, in the series. Uh, you wanted to know, many of you asked a question about uh, questions that you wanted to hear us preach about and one of the one of the topics was submission submission that's a dirty word ain't it submission um but it's not a dirty word it's actually a beautiful word it's actually an order order a word and i want to uh today i will not be i know a lot of you asked a question about as it relates to submission in marriage uh i won't be dealing with that topic that will be pastor Juan and pastor ruthie coming up later on I'm going to deal with submission as a principle of Christianity, a pr principle of faith, that we are to be people submitted unto God. Amen? Amen. How many of you know that, that that's what, the, what uh, Christianity is all about, is about living submitted lives? When we, talk about, when we talk about submission, we're really talking about a theme that runs through every sermon and every, uh, every ministry we do. Uh, we're talking about something that is the lifeblood of Christianity and the Christian faith. And, and when I talked to Pastor Juan a couple of days ago, uh, when I was sharing him with him what I was thinking about preaching, one of the things he talked about was how this really is his life's message. When you think about um, the things that he loves to preach more than anything else, you can really point to love. We know, we know that, right? Make Christ known by the way we everywhere we go and then the second one is the crucified life the crucified life and so that's what submission is all about it is about the crucified say crucified life it is when we live a crucified life it is it is our gratitude and appreciation for for the sacrifice jesus made at calvary that jesus died on the cross for our sins through faith now because he died, we now act out this walk of submission and this, this walk of submissive faith. Believers are called and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live lives uh, in intimate relationship with God. I need y'all to talk with me. Say intimate relationship 
with God. How many of y'all want to be intimate with God? All right. The crucified life means that, 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 that when I give my life to Christ, when I begin to submit my will to his will, when I exchange his will, my will for his will, and I begin to exchange my lies for his truth, when I exchange my lives, how I've lived my life, what I've thought about my life, the perspectives that I have in life, that I've decided that I've, I've gained this perspective, I, I know what's best for me. When I exchange that for what he has said in his word, and as I break agreement, say break agreement, break agreement. with the worldly perspectives and choose to govern my life by kingdom principles, God's divine nature then comes alive in me. How many of you know you cannot have the Spirit of God or the nature of God come alive with you if you're still connected to an old mindset? That's why the Bible says, let this mind that is in Christ Jesus also be in us. And so we have to get to the point where we lay down. I don't care how, how sensible it sounds. I don't care how good it sounds to us. If it is against God's word, it is a lie. The Bible says if we're going to come to the Lord, those who come to the Lord must first believe that he is. He is. He is what? He is what God said, what he said he is. He is the truth. The Bible says Jesus said that I am the truth, the, the, the way and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by. And so we have to know, uh, we have to know that, that God is true. And we have to live as if God is true and not our own perspective. When we do that, the more we submit, then our character begins to change. The nature in us begins to grow and mature. And we begin to develop in his character. And as his character develops in us, listen to this, his power then is beginning, begins to, to be displayed in our lives. So we have this exchange. We have this exchange, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 reads this way. Paul, Paul described it as, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A lot of us, listen to this, most of us think that Jesus came, that he lived this life, he was born of a virgin, he lived this life, this sinless life, he died on the cross, uh, he was uh, uh, buried resurrected and he ascended in heaven we think all of that is just so we can get to heaven and that's not what that's not uh i'm that is a part of the package but that's not the total fruit that's not the total gift right the reason why is not about getting man into heaven it's about getting heaven into man it's not about getting us somewhere it's about getting god back into the earth and so God, when, when, whenever, whenever Jesus died on the cross, what he did, he gave us this exchange to now where he takes our sin and we take on his righteousness. And because we take on his righteousness, now we become uh, representatives and ambassadors of, of, he, of heaven in the earth realm. So righteousness is a big word, a big uh, $100 word that simply means I'm in right standing with God. Say right standing. right standing. Now right standing is alignment with his principles and his laws. It doesn't mean that you're not going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean that you're not going to mess up from time to time. But I make a decision when I'm in alignment with God's word. I make a decision that he is true and every man is a liar. Even And when I say every man, I say every man. I'm not just talking about the people around you are lying. I'm talking about you lying to yourself. Because many of us have gained perspectives about ourselves that we, we, we use this lie, I'm this or I'm that. This is how he made me. This is what I am. And you are not this and that. You are what God called you. And it's not until I exchange our lie, my lie, for God's perspective that his nature can begin to grow in me. And it is through the alignment that I have that I have entrance into intimacy with God. Okay, quiz time. Quiz time. What is Get Rap's purpose? Anybody? Uh, 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 wrong answer. Thank you for playing. 
What is, no, you said it last service. Who, who can tell me what, what the purpose of Get Wrapped is? To help everyone develop an intimate relationship with God. Say that with me. To help everyone develop an intimate relationship with God. Oh, y'all don't sound very good. Say it again. The purpose of Get Wrapped is to help everyone develop an intimate relationship with God. Next time I preach, I want to hear the answer. Why is this important? Because God wants relationship with you. God is not just sitting up there saying, God, I, just, I want you to do everything I do for the simple fact of, of just having you do stuff. He wants you to conform to his likeness and his rules and his precepts because he is a holy God that can't have relationship with anything that's not holy. And it's through Jesus that we live out this life of holiness and he walks in relationship with us. How many have ever seen a welder? In a, in a welder, what do you do when you're handling, as a welder, what do you do when you're handling that hot, that hot iron? You use gloves. Why? Because if you don't, if you touch something, if you touch it, your skin can't handle the magnitude of the heat of the iron. The same way is with holiness. We walk in holiness because our fra in our frailness, we can't handle God's divinity. And so walking in a holy lifestyle and submitting to his rules gives us access to be able to handle his glory. And so the more I submit to his will, then the closer I can get to him. Oh, that was free right there. All right, so... So we, 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 everybody wants to walk in this intimate relationship. Go to James 4. James 4, 4 through 6 reads this way. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world or, uh, means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world um, becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Say this with me. God opposes the proud. proud. We're in this thing called Pride Week. And this is not a bash. This is not a bash. This is a pride is not just about about a, a, a sexual orientation. Pride is about anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. And many of you might not have a, 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 a wayward sexual orientation, but many of us have wayward thought processes as it relates to places in our lives. We have wayward thought processes as it relates to how we relate to one another. We have wayward thought processes in our integrity. We have wayward thought processes in how we speak to one another. We have wayward processes in how we deal with our spouses and our husbands and our wives. We have wayward uh, thought processes in, in every area of our life, and we wonder why we are being opposed. It is not the devil. Many of us have given the devil more credit than he deserves. It ain't about the devil. It's about God being against you. I, I, whatever, you know, hey, you, I, I, uh. okay, check this out. Here's the question I have for you. Here's the question I have for you, and I hope this hits you right in the gut. I hope it hits you right in the gut. The reality is, if I told you, if I told you, 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 can, handle, you can handle yourself with these, right? You do pretty good. Uh, if I were to come at you and try to, try, to, try to overtake you, even though I'm bigger than you, I got more size on you, you're probably stronger than me because I ain't worked out in a while. But you can see, you can, you can gather in your mind how you could possibly take me. If it's nothing but kick me in the knees. You, 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 you can gather, if I oppose you, you can find a way to defeat me. What about God? He says he sets himself against you. You can't oppose God. I don't care what kind of, I don't care what kind of gun you take out. 
You can't oppose God. And many of us opposing him with the way we think and the way we act and our attitudes and our behaviors, we are opposing him. And God says, okay, it ain't the devil against you, it's me. I'm not letting you walk that way. Oh, God. In verse 4, when it says, that, do, not, do you not know that friendship with the world is agreement with uh, or, or, or means enmity with God? You are literally setting yourself up. When I agree with the way the world's perspective, I am setting myself up uh, to be an enemy, 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 an enemy of God. Listen to this, point number one. Pride is the enemy of submission and intimacy with God. When you start putting yourself, your own thought processes, your own will, God, I know what your word says, but, I, but I, I'm just me. I'm just who I am. I'm going to do what I want to do. I, uh, you know what? I'm just, I got an attitude. I got an anger issue. No, you ain't got an anger issue. You got, you got a submission problem. Huh? Well you, don't, you, well, you just got to accept the way I am. No, he don't. No, he don't. And I'm not talking at you. I'm talking with you. I'm trying to tell you, God, before I preach this sermon to you, God, I had to preach it to myself. What ways are in you that are not in alignment with my will for your life, Todd? What are you doing? We have to get if we... when. Okay. The Bible says that pride goes before the fall. Pride is the arrogant mindset that believes that I am sufficient outside of Jesus. I don't have to listen to you, Jesus. I, I know your word says this, but that, that, that ain't my thing. I know it says that you need to walk in, I need to walk in community, but you know, I don't like people. Huh? I, I, I know it says I, I need to, I, I, know, I know it says I need to watch my tongue and not talk so, so ugly, and, but, but you know what? When I'm with my real boys, they accept me for what I say. They don't judge me. They don't judge me. What Jesus does. Mm -mm. Okay, all right. Many of us have become so, so become so confident in our own sufficiency that we have become enemies of God. We think that we know better for our lives than God does. And instead of submitting to, to him in every area of our lives, we become... We become our own Lord, and we live our lives, and we pick and choose out of the Bible. We pick and choose out of the Bible what we want to, what we, what we want to adhere to and what we want to listen to based off what's comfort. So if it's not comfortable for me, God, that ain't, that ain't a word for me. That's your truth. That ain't my truth. Yeah, well, see, see your truth is a lie. Oh, God. Okay, go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. If you can't say amen, say ouch. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord. Say, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. It says, trust. Trust. Uh, trust, is, trust is when you submit everything to God. He says, in all your ways. That means, that means that is not a part of my life I, I, I can take back and say, God, I'm going to give you all of this. I'm going to give you 98%, but these 2% I'm going to hang on to. So I can't, I can't give you 98% of my life and, and, give you, and, and hang on to my attitude. Or my, I can't give you all of this, but hang on to my lying. I can't give you all of this, but hang on to my sexuality. I can't, hang, I can't give you this, but hang on to what makes me comfortable. Oh, God, trust in the Lord. Say trust. trust. Now, I was going to do, I was going to do this uh, example. Where's Dante? Dante, he, I was going to bring Dante up here, and he was going to stand here, and he said he, was, he would do it, and I was going to bring all the ushers up here, and I was going to have them stand up there, and I was going to tell Dante to fall, <laughs> and I was going to have him catch, and he said he would do it. <laughs> but then, but then, there you go over there. I thought... I picked Dante because even though he's tall, he's slender a bill, so I figured they could, they could catch him. 
But then as I got closer to the sermon, as I got closer to the sermon, I started worrying. <laughs> I was like, what if they dropped that joke on that floor? <laughs> Pastor ain't going to let me come back up there and preach no more. We done injured somebody up in church. We're going to have to stop the live feed and all that type of stuff. So I said, no, we're not going to do it. But what I realized when I thought about that is this. Trust is not about the circumstance. Trust is about the arms that you're falling into. And many of us say that we trust God, but we won't do what he say because we really don't trust him to catch us. So if I pay my tithes, I don't trust you, God, to catch my bills. If, 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 if I don't cuss this person out, I'm not trusting you to take care of the situation for me. If, if, if I don't do it the way I have, have determined to do it, then I, I really don't trust you. See, trust has a behavior that matches what you say. Trust is reflected in a forward movement of obedience. And so that obedience will always lead to submission. That trust will always lead to submission. Where God, I don't, I don't know how, but God, I fall. And I trust you that when I fall, you're going to catch me. It is, it is literally, listen to this, it is, it is literally Peter stepping out of the boat on something that is not supposed to hold him. But nevertheless, at your word, I do what you say with the expectation that you're going to hold me. And trust, can I tell you something? Trust it's not about whether it feels good. I really prayed about, I shared this first service, and, I, and I'm glad you're not in here right now. Well, I'm not glad. I, I asked it, could I share it? But trust is not just in times when it feels good to you. The crucified life is about, Jesus didn't want to die. He said, God, if you would, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We all, Paul said, it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. It ain't about me. It's not about my comfort. It's not about what feels good. It is, it is Mariana when she sings her song. And she's up here. Some of y'all know the story. She, lost, she didn't lost heaven, gained her, her child, her son. It was a loss to them, but a gain to heaven. And every time she sings this song, I don't know if y'all miss it, miss it, but I, but I cry every time. Every time I even think about it. She sings this song that says, I don't forget the name of the song. I should have got it doing between services. But when she says, uh, when I laid in that hospital bed, you are worthy. When I could barely lift my head, you are worthy. Many of you are so caught up in worship that you missed that she changed the lyrics because the lyrics of the song was written by a man who was looking at her, his wife. And he said, the lyrics go, when she was laying in that hospital bed, you are worthy. When, I, when she could barely lift her head, you are worthy. When Mariana stands up here in front of you and she sings it, she sings it for the moment that she was in where she was in a hospital and just had to allow her to give her son over to God and let him go to heaven. Angel stands back down that, that soundboard and listens to it. The moment where she's going through the worst moment, where she had to give up everything. And she said, in this moment, you're still worthy. You're still God. I live the crucified life. It ain't about my comfort. It's not about me. It's about you. And regardless of what it costs me, if it costs me friends, you're worthy. If it costs people looking at me, you're worthy. You're worthy, God. 
You're worthy, God. If I don't have the money I want, you're worthy. If I'm broke, and I, come on, you're worthy. If I, if I lose everything, you're worthy. If nobody likes me on Facebook, and on, oh, you're worthy, God. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Huh? If I had to, if I have to go to the cross, I will. Because your life and you living through me means more than everything. Many of us fall apart. Fall apart with every little thing. We fall apart when we lose a job and then we go and we give. We start acting a fool and we start drinking and we start doing all this. No, the crucified life says, God, I trust you through it all. I trust you. Last week, last week during the storm on Wednesday night, on Wednesday night, me and Tanya, we were, we were at the office, and Christian was going with, with the team to, to, to the conference. And I came out to go and pick him up, and a 40-foot tree had fallen on top of my car in the storm. And I said, God, you're still worth it. Because the crucified life is not attached to a car. Gotta move on. In this particular passage, the, the word, the word acknowledge is the word. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge him or submit is the word yada, which means to discover, to know, and to be directed by. Say discover, discover. Know, know, be directed by. In other words, you gotta learn to discover what God's word is, what, what his word says. Stop trying to lean to your own understanding, but find, get up and pick up your Bible. I don't care that you can't read that well. I don't care that this is not your thing. Go and read his word. You cannot get closer to God without his word. And many of us, listen to this, we're coming in here on Sunday morning, and we're waiting for pastor to get up here or somebody to get up here and preach to discover God's, God's word. And the reality is, it's not it's not. Pastor one knowing the word that saves you is you knowing the word that saves you. The Bible says, listen to this, we perish for a lack of knowledge. And we are perishing in our life. And all hell is breaking through because we don't listen to his word. We don't study to know him. Whoever that was, hallelujah. <laughs> Hebrews 11, 3 and 11 says, this is why I was angry with the generations. This is God. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath and anger in my anger, they shall not enter my rest. Do you know something? Many of you, many of us are not entering into the rest or the favor of God because we accept, excuse me, we accept in our own way over his. He said, I ain't even going to let you walk in rest. I'm not even going to let you walk in blessing. Because you won't, you won't listen to me. I know this is a hard word. Here's my side point. Failure to trust in God through submission avoids you of the right for supernatural promise. If you keep doing what, you, what you're doing and what you want to do, don't expect that God is going to give you what he wants to give you. James 4 and 7. James 4 and 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Listen to this. The word submit is the word hypotasio, which, is, which means to arrange under, to come under, to subject, uh, be subject to oneself, to obey, to submit, to one's control. God says that if you want to avoid a destructive life, you have to submit to what he's asking you to do, no matter what it feels like. Arrange yourself. When you submit, it is the positioning. It is you positioning yourself for blessings. If you get out of alignment and you do what you want to do just because you want to do it and you voice your right and you go with the world and tell, say the things that the world is saying, you are out of position and the blessing that God wants to give you will not come in your life. 
Hallelujah. The devil wants you to have this attitude. And let me tell y'all something. There's some of you in here right now that's saying, yeah, well, y'all just got to be patient with me. Y'all got to be patient with me. Y'all got to give me grace because I am what I am. I am what I am. You know what you're saying? God, I'll come and get blessed when, when, when I want to. I'll come and get blessed when I want to. I'm, I'm fine right now where I am. I'm fine being away from you. I'm fine not submitting to your will. So, so here we are. Submit yourselves, the Bible says, to his, his will. Now, I need for y'all to understand, when you look at verses 7 and 8 in that text of Scripture, they go together. Submit yourselves then to the Lord and resist the devil, and he will flee. How many of you want the devil to flee from you? Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands. How many of you want God to come near to you? You want me to tell you how to do it? Submit. Do what he tell you to do. Do what he tell you to do. And so this brings me to my second point. Point number two. Submission repels the enemy and draws you closer to the Father. Submission repels the enemy. You want to get the devil away from you? He's afraid of your alignment with God's word. He will start running from you if you resist him. And the way that that word says to you resist the devil is not through shamalama ding dong, uh, father in the name, so da 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 da. Oh God, I come against you. I do warfare on your behalf. And I'm not trying to make a mockery of prayer. I am not trying to make a mockery of prayer. But many of us are praying for stuff that God has already empowered us to do. Prayer has its place. Some stuff won't come out with, except through prayer. But the truth of the matter is, the first place you got to start is through obedience. You can pray all you want to. If you're not being obedient, God ain't doing nothing for you. Huh. John 1 and 12 says this, To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The word received is the word trust and submit to. Say trust, trust. And, submit. and submit. The word receive is the word lambano, which means to take and to apprehend. So I need to apprehend what God is saying. I got to trust and submit to it. And then it says when we do this, he gives us the right. Or in the King James, it says the power to become sons of God. And you know what that word power is? It is the word exousia. That word exousia means this. It means spiritual authority, spiritual and mental power, and the power of choice. You need to understand, when you start walking in what God asks you to do, you have spiritual authority over the devil. The devil is under our feet when we submit to the will of the Father. And I stop saying that I, 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 it's hard, I can't do it. That ain't what the scriptures say. Exchange your life for his truth. At the moment that you decide, make a decision in your mind, I'm giving this up. I'm walking with Jesus. I want God's perspective. At the moment you have, exousia comes on your life. Exousia comes on life. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, he's made a decision. She's made a decision. Now, as she begins to put boundaries around her life through the word of God, I'm going to stand in her and get up in her and give her the power. Exousia. Romans 1, 28 says, this is on the other hand, but if you don't, listen to this. When humanity does not think it worthy to retain and submit to God's instruction." He hands us over to a reprobate mind. He says, when you don't want to do what I want to tell you, he says, you want that depraved mind that you think is right? I've seen men who, I, 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 had, I had an uncle back in the days. He took me as a 15-year-old as a boy out of town to do a trip where his mis he went to go see his mistress. 
and had me stay in a hotel while he was visiting his mistress and then told me concerning my aunt, she don't have to know. What she don't know won't hurt her. As long as you're taking care of the home, she all right. And it's amazing how we can get, with, get these, de, these depraved mindsets that seem right to a man, but the end thereof is what? Destruction. So let's go to James 4, 9 through 10. We're about to finish. He said, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. That don't seem like something you ought to be doing as a Christian. Crying, mourning, wailing, not laughing. But listen to the context of this. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you. What is he talking about? Here I am. Here I am. I, I, I feel like that, that I have a different perspective about my life than what God has for my life. So I feel like I, I'm, my sexuality is different. So this is the moment. God's word tells me what I am. This lifestyle that I've lived I have to wail and cry walking away from it. I have to be in mourning and say, God, you mean more to me than this. God, God, it's hard. It's hard. Listen this. It's hard to walk away and to kill my pride. But I died to that because I, your relationship with you means more to me than a relationship with the world. Okay, that ain't your issue. God, I want to go to the party. I want to drop it like it's hot. <laughs> but you told me to live a life of holiness and righteousness before you. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy drinking. I enjoy partying. I enjoy exposing myself and living by my body rather than. But God, you told me to dress in an humble way. You told me to talk in an humble way, in a respectful way. Yeah, I wanted to cuss you out because you did me wrong. You did me wrong. And I wanted to cuss you out, but no, God, being holy means more to me. And so if I have to if I have to walk away from it crying, if I have to walk away from it crying, I will. And listen to this, this bring, verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Point, last point, and we finish. Come on. Enduring submission brings supernatural empowerment and increase. I'm over here. God, I don't want to walk away from this. I've enjoyed the person that I am. Because it's, all, it's been all about me. But God, wherever you lead me, I will go. I'm submitted to you. It's hard. It hurts. It doesn't feel good. The crucified life ain't, ain't a life of prominence and prestige. Jesus died on the cross to crucify life and was bloody and beaten and bruised so much that he was unrecognizable. But he gave his life on the cross so that we could live. And so now I give you my life, God. I walk away from everything that I thought was me and I renew my mind to your word. And it might sting for a little while because you might have to lose some friends. It might sting for a little while because you might have to lose some comfort. But he says, if you do it long enough, he will exalt you. The Bible says that we ought to have this mind that is in Christ. Come on, stand up. The mind that was found in Christ that didn't consider himself worthy of obtaining a holding on to the fact that he was equal to God. 
but he humbled himself and submitted to God's will. Became a servant. Became a servant. But God, I'm here to serve you. I'm not here to serve my own mindsets, my own thought processes. I'm here to serve you. What did we say Paul said? It's no longer Christ that li- me that lives, but Christ that lives in me. Deuteronomy 28 says, if you'll fully obey the laws and decrees I give you this day, I will cause blessings to overtake you. Does that mean that you're not going to have seasons where it's hard? But when you submit, the next step is elevation. Father, my prayer is today that we would understand the beauty of the crucified life. That we would have the faith and the courage to lay down everything that opposes your glory. That whatever you say, we submit to. There are some areas of your life that you have not given to the Lord. Right now, I'm asking you to give it to him. Because simply saying that you believe in Jesus does not make you a Christian. The Bible says that the devil believes in Jesus. The demons believe in God. So you, that's, that's not what makes you a believer. What makes you a believer is lordship. Where we give you everything, God. In Jesus.